Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. This is Jane. She thinks she's just filling her car, but she's also filling the air with cancer-causing toxic chemicals used to boost octane and gas. What doesn't burn in the engine enters the air and your lungs, even your heart and brain. Bad for everyone, especially kids. Ethanol is a natural octane booster, clean burning and non-toxic. More ethanol means less scary stuff in our gas and in the air we breathe. And that makes your choice pretty plain. Jane, American Ethanol, cleaner air for Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs looks at domestic beef demand. Brent Gloy compares farm real estate values and net income. Alan Vanolik talks about succession planning and Jay Parsons outlines options for ensuring pastures and ranges. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. The U.S. Department of Agriculture believes American farmers and ranchers will produce 5% more beef in 2017 than they did in 2016. Feedlots have been placing more animals this year. In fact, in seven of the first eight months, those placements were higher than the previous year. That includes August total, which was 3% above a year ago. The October live cattle futures contract before Friday's latest cattle on feed report closed at its highest level since early August, but analysts were expecting more friendly numbers. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning and asked how the market reacted to the latest estimates. Not as much as I thought, actually. I thought the markets were getting way out of hand last week where we were pushing the markets up. They were planning on a bullish report. They didn't get it. I didn't think they'd get it placements were up way over what expectations were and so that just crushed the market we went, went limit down on monday we were down quite a bit yesterday and man it just snapped right back today and i'm kind of perplexed by that to be real honest with you there's plenty of fat cattle out here i do not know however what the packer has for october contracts and he's only a week away from being able to pull those so this cash week's struggle is going to really be a pretty telltale sale telltale sign if the Packer can win this arm wrestling match we have a problem if we can hold our own then maybe things aren't going to be so bad tell me first why placements were higher well I think you've had a lot of placements come from the north where we had the drought out of Montana and the Dakotas I think you saw a lot of early placements cattle that would have normally come later and there was a lot of cattle a lot of cattle down off of off the Flint Hills and those all it was time for them to come so you saw some greater placements there in in August than maybe you typically would have I think you're going to see big placements again this month which once again gives me another thing that gives me a little bit of caution is how we're building a big premium in these, these deferreds you're asking for cattle and cattlemen will respond and we'll place cattle in and all of a sudden I wonder if that premium will remain. Explain more about that deferred relationship to what cattle producers will do. Anytime you see the market in a premium structure, in other words, the deferreds are worth more than the nearby, you're asking, you're tell, the market is telling you several things. One, feed your cattle longer because they're gonna be worth more out front. Place more cattle because we want cattle out here so people are placing cattle and that's what the market does. We're really good at responding to market signals. Over just the last few weeks, they've taken, the, we were selling cash cattle over the board. That went away, now cash cattle are under the board. And so people have started to hold their cattle, which is what the market was telling you to do. Well, now we're putting more pounds on the market. Thank gosh that we've got great demand. We've got great exports, we've got great domestic demand, and that's helping us a lot because we're slaughtering more cattle than we were last year we're producing more beef than we were last year even though not it's it's not a significant amount but every pound we put on those animals is going to make more as we go forward let's focus more on domestic demand are you at all concerned now that grilling season's over you know i'm really not maybe that's maybe that's pollyannish of me but i don't i don't think so i think this year versus last year, it, beef is a much better value for the consumer. The consumer's a little bit better off because the economy's good and they want to eat beef. 
and I think we're just gonna continue to roll through this. We've already seen this week, you always have a big push for middle meats going into the Christmas holiday. That's already started. And when your middle meats are dragging this thing up, that, that's not a bad deal. And internationally? International is tremendous. Now a lot of that has to do with the value of the dollar, but it just keeps coming and I think, I think we're in really good shape all the way around. Have you seen a response from China? You know, I, that was interesting. We talked about that before we turned on the cameras. I actually had a call today wanting to know if I had any cattle that qualify for China. Although they never would tell me what they wanted to pay, for, pay me for them, I don't have any, so that's probably why. Um, that China thing, I really think that was just foo-foo personally. Said, yeah, sure, we'll open our markets, but then they made, they cracked the door open about this far because the requirements are so stiff. I have no idea what kind of premium they're willing to pay for those cattle because those cattle are going to be considerably more expensive to produce. So I don't know what's really going to happen there. I don't think it's going to be a big deal personally. Okay, but do you think it's the right move to be in there in case those restrictions would start to narrow down or widen out, I guess? Why well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's great to be in there. You know, we've been sending stuff through the back door through Vietnam and through Hong Kong for years. So let's just let's just be real and open it up and go. Now maybe they will do that at some point they'll they'll lessen the restrictions just like japan did a few years ago and then we can really roll right in there hopefully that'll happen i would like to see that happen because i think a lot of those restrictions are unnecessary and they send the wrong message personally so before we had that cattle on feed report markets were starting to climb a little bit did you hope that maybe that would continue well you always want the market to go up um I, like I said, I didn't. I thought that was all a big head fake by the market. I didn't think that we need, we had a bullish cattle on feed coming. I don't think the next one's going to be bullish from the standpoint of placements. Now, if we continue to market cattle like we've been marketing them ahead of schedule, we don't let them get too heavy, demand hangs in there, maybe those placements, placement numbers don't matter quite as much because we're rolling through the cattle. But we'll see as we go forward. Meaning you think we chop sideways? It's possible. Or? or I think we could go higher, but it all depends. You know, if, if guys really hold cattle here because of that premium structure in the market and put a lot of pounds on these cattle, we're quite a ways away from the 215 carcass, high, carcass weights. Gosh, I hope we don't get there either because the amount of extra tonnage we'd put on this market, I don't know if it could handle it, but I think we're in good shape right now. Next week, Iowa State Extension Livestock Economist Lee Schultz will recap the USDA's latest hogs and pigs inventory report, and John Moret from J.E. Moret Grain Company will look at corn and soybean markets. Nebraska cropland cash rents eased slightly in 2017, according to recently released USDA data. The average cost of $194 per acre was down $2 from last year, but the state continues to feature some of the priciest land in the country. The top dry land cash rent of $266 an acre in Dakota County was the 10th highest in the U.S. The most expensive statewide irrigated cash rent was in Dixon County at $312. Ag land values have seen an incredible rise. In this state, they're two and a half times more costly per acre than only 10 years ago before adjusting for inflation. Purdue University economist Brent Gloy, who farms in southwest Nebraska, recently wrote on agEconomist.com about the farm real estate run-up and whether current levels are alarming. We talked with Brent this week in Omaha about cash rents, interest rates, and how farmland values across the nation have increased. Farmland has been on a tremendous run. Uh, you look since like 1992, it's really increased a lot uh, over time. And just recently, it's finally started to maybe plateau a little bit, which um, I think was about time because uh, they, it's just gone up so much in the last 10, 15 years. You compared that value to the value of farm production. First tell me why you're using that measurement and what you see when you compare it. Right. I once uh, remember a stock analyst was telling me how he valued stocks and, and he said, you know, the top line number, the revenue is really the best number because it's the hardest to kind of manipulate and uh, so we want to use just gross receipts and say okay how does farmland pricing compare relative to the gross income that the farm sector generates and so that's why we use value of farm production. And what we found is that uh, today uh, farm real estate uh, relative to its value of production is quite high. Uh, it's continued to 
become more expensive relative to the income that we're generating in the sector. So you think this is a possible warning sign? Yeah, I think one of, it's, it's one thing to look at it and say, well, look, you know, it, how much income does that asset base generate? And uh, right now, that, that income that's generating is relatively low relative to how much you have to spend for that, that uh, farmland you purchase. So we look at that as kind of saying, well, you know, it's, it's a flag. And, and it's, probably, it's not a green flag, it's maybe a caution flag to say, hey, let's, let's pay attention to this because we're not getting as much income for our dollar of investment in farmland. Are those values alarming when you look at net income as well? Yeah, so we also looked at net income, uh, which is probably a, you know, a better measure or another measure that you can look at. And when, you, when you look at that, uh, that ratio is as low as it's been since 1983, I think. So in other words, the net income we get out of that real estate, we're just not getting that much net income out of the real estate. So it seems pricey relative to the net income it's generating the current economic environment that Nebraska's in and a lot of the Midwest is in, would you expect that that would push land values down? Yeah, and I think you're seeing that. Uh, it, most of the statistics we see out of Iowa and Nebraska land value reports suggest that land values have come off of their highs. And in s some ways, as an economist, I think, well, it's good because it shows the market's actually working. It means that you know, I'd be concerned if it were still shooting higher and income is falling. So I think that's good. On the other hand, uh, as a farmer and as someone who owns farmland, I don't want to see it going down because strong farmland values mean the farm sector is really healthy. And so I think uh, we're seeing, you know, the health of the farm sector reflected in lower farmland values, which is, is rational. What role would interest, play, interest rates play? Interest rates are one of the biggest drivers right now are supporters of farmland values. They're very low on the long-term side. So I said before, if you take the cash rent and divide it by the farmland value, you're going to get something we call a capitalization rate, which is kind of a rate of return on farmland. In Nebraska, it's probably around 3% in most places before property taxes. So if you take out another, some places, $50 an acre in property taxes, maybe more in some counties, uh, you're cutting that rate of return even lower. Um, the reason people want to accept such a low rate of return is because interest rates are really, really low. And so I think our 10-year Treasury bond is somewhere around 2.5% today. Um, that's low. And as long as it stays low, I think people will be willing to accept returns like that. If it starts working higher, then I think people start to say, well, I'm not going to take a 2.5% return on my farmland. I want a little bit more. How do you get it? You either have to have higher rent or lower farmland values. Uh, higher rents in this environment is a tough sell, I think. Well, I do want to ask you about cash rents. The numbers in Nebraska, I just want to get your overall emotions on this. Irrigated land, the highest on average is over $300. Dry land is over 250 Give me your thoughts. Yeah, that's uh, quite high. Uh, in fact, I was in one of those counties last year. I was giving them a little grief about being at the highest uh, cash rent rental rate in the state of Nebraska. You know, it's high. And uh, I know as a farmer, it's, you know, the rental markets are very competitive and uh, it's a tough decision. But at this point in time, those, those numbers are, are quite high. It's hard to make a very good return when, when we're paying those kind of cash rents. So I still look for cash rents to be a little bit soft, but uh, I've got to admit that uh, I've been saying that for a while and, and the cash rental market has been fairly strong, not as soft as I would expect, let me put it that way. Yeah, I think that's the final question. How would you advise farmers during this off season if land comes up or if they need to renegotiate rents and things like that? Right. I think, you know, it's important to have open and honest dialogue with uh, landowners about where uh, the economics are and, and work to explain uh, the situation to them as well as, uh, you know, evaluate your opportunities carefully. I you know, I don't think it's right to say you shouldn't rent the farm. I mean, there are reasons you, you should do it. But I think it's important to really understand what the economics of renting that, that property are at, the, at various rental rates. You know, just do some analysis and see what kind of return uh, you're likely to get. Another thing to watch for um, is, 
you know, budgeting government program payments. So uh, in 2017, in maybe about a month, I think, uh, you're going to start to see some pretty big government program payments uh, received by farmers in a lot of counties. Not every county, uh, but in a lot of counties. But I would say that we need to be careful to realize that, one, there's a one-year lag on that. So um, you're going to get the government payment next year for the land you farm this year, not, you know, it's, it's a year behind, which is kind of confusing, I think, to people. And two, uh, the payments under the ARC program, ARC County, ARC County program, are going to start going down really rapidly. And so if you're budgeting large ARC County payments in your budgets next year, I think you want to look carefully to see whether that's a good assumption or not. Look at some of the university resources that are out there on that issue, and I think you'll see that uh, most people are expecting them to decline. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to Brent's recent article as well as CropWatch maps of cash rents in Nebraska. The University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Department of Agricultural Economics is trying to learn more about succession planning in the state. Nebraska Extension Farm Succession Educator Alan Vanalek says he hopes producers will fill out a quick online survey to describe their plans for retirement or passing their operations on to the next generation. At Husker Harvest Days recently, Alan explained why he thought the survey would be useful. So a recent survey of Iowa farmers says that 70% do not to plan to fully retire. And I, I find that to be an interesting number, and I would like to know what that is for our Nebraska farmers. So we're doing a survey about your succession plans uh, for Nebraska farmers, and we'd like, to go, like people to go to a website uh, titled go.unl.edu slash succession to tell us about what your plans are for what you're going to do with the farm and as, as you leave the farm and leave it for the next generation. It's going to take about five minutes to complete. Uh, do you have a succession plan in place? Do you have a, a living will in place? Do you have a, a power of attorney in place uh, for the living will? And do you have a power of attorney in place uh, for your will? Uh, do you, uh, where do you plan to get income for retirement? Uh, where, where's that going to come from? What are, you, what are you planning to do there? Just some simple questions about what plans are in place and, and maybe mostly to jog people's memory that, oh, I should figure some of this stuff out. Allen says he'd like producers to complete the survey by Thanksgiving. The September Nebraska farmer says when you think of Nebraska, you probably think of corn. This month's magazine says while feedlots across the state use corn and ethanol co-products as staples in their rations, some continue to find ways to improve efficiencies. Albers Feedlot, a 20,000 head feeding facility located north of Wisner, uses steam flaked corn to battle higher feed costs and help feed conversion. You can read about their process in the September Nebraska Farmer. Insurance could be a beneficial risk management tool for producers. For farmers and ranchers with livestock, the Pasture, Rangeland, Forage, Insurance, Rainfall Index could offer assistance under situations with lower than average precipitation. Nebraska Extension's Jay Parsons joined us recently to explain coverage options and the goal of the program. Well, basically it's a precipitation risk insurance that uh, protects producers that have perennial pasture uh, for livestock uh, production um, from that precipitation risk. So if they don't get enough rainfall, this is an opportunity to insure uh, against that. So when we talked about doing this, I said, uh, we, we talked about the possibility of rain in 2018, and you said you would prefer producers don't think of it like that, but rather as a strategic decision. Tell me why. Uh, because basically you got to make your decision on which months you're going to insure and how many, how many dollar values you're going to put on everything by November 15th to sign up for the next calendar year. So right there you're already looking out quite a ways in terms of uh, any kind of weather forecast. And the other thing is, is most producers that I've talked to, all producers that I've talked to that are happy with the product and using the product have developed a long-term strategy that they've stuck with over time instead of trying to guess when it's going to rain or not going to rain, put in and on or not putting it on. Tell me about the details of the program. Well, November 15th is a sign-up, as I mentioned. You can put uh, different dollar values on that you have some flexibility there. Your dollar per acre is, is basically determined by county, um, and then you have flexibility around that. You can go 60% of that value or up to 150% of that value. And then, um, so that'll give you a dollar value per acre that you're actually attaching to it. And then you can ensure up to 90% of the expected rainfall. So the rainfall data is provided by NOAA, and it goes back to 1948. 
And what they do is they basically average that out and average is the expectation and you're ensuring a percentage of that. But it's not on your operation, the rainfall. There's no rain gauge on your operation or anything like that. It's no uh, weather stations that are providing the data for each grid. And the grids are, depending on where you're at, uh, in Nebraska we basically say 12 miles by 12 miles, but technically speaking it's 0.25 degrees longitude by 0.25 degrees latitude. When we talk about the cost, how much is subsidized? This is subsidized just like regular crop insurance. So anywhere from 51% up to 59%. If you're insuring at the highest level at 90% coverage, that's it subsidized at 51%. And then as you insure less rainfall, it's subsidized more heavily. So how well used is this in Nebraska, do you think? Um, well, we're basically running about $10 million worth of coverage in the state is what we've had the last couple of years, $10, $11 million kind of stuff. So it sounds significant, but, you know, it's really only maybe a tenth of what could be covered. Do you think more should be covered or producers could use this as a bigger part of their risk management strategy? I think it's a good way to uh, protect against, obviously, against the precipitation risk of, of having dry weather and not having the pasture that you prefer. Uh, like I said, if you stick with it as a long-term strategy, just like people have grown used to with, say, corn production or soybean production, where crop insurance is just part of your expected expenses, I think it could be a, a, a good supplement to the income that they would have on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, depending upon rainfall. Will most producers insure those most important months of grazing? Is that what their game plan is? You know, people take different strategies on it. Usually people do want to ensure the months that the uh, rainfall is most important to them. Uh, determining when it is most important, though, can be a bit of a crapshoot, right? Because you can have a nice wet spring and say everything's cool, and then the last half of the summer dries off, and you still have to pull the cows off early. Um, but because you can spread it out and, and essentially cover all the months you want if you, if you strategize that way, I usually tell people if you aren't sure, spread it out and, and then you're more likely to get a payment, and at least some payment out of some of the months uh, to help you through those tough times. Well, when would those payments occur versus something like a major disaster program? Well, that's kind of the neat thing about it is, is because it's, it's determined every two months. So these intervals you are insuring are two-month intervals. So the first one you could insure, of course, would be January, February. And let's say you did, and, and precipitation ended up being 40% of normal and you had a payment coming your way. Um, those payments are basically, the indexes are usually announced within a month, and payments are usually taking place within two months kind of thing. Now, the way the product works is like crop insurance in that you don't have to pay the premium up front. So your premium is paid first before you actually see a check. And then if, if September rolls around and you haven't paid up your premium, then you actually owe money for your premium. And finally, Jay, how might an online tool help producers better determine what coverage level might be right for them? Well, that's a cool thing is that RMA has developed a very sophisticated, I should say, but it's easy enough to use, online tool where producers can go in and they can actually find their property the grid that it's in and so on and so forth and the, and the different uh, cost to the coverage, put in some sample coverage, see how it's performed over the years and again the data goes all the way back to 1948 so they can play with it till their heart's content and see how it would have performed over the years and uh, one of the neat things that I've done with producers is, is when they're unsure you know what to do in terms of the coverage and I always say just it's a financial tool for you. So fill that out, go back over the years and see with the years you needed money and if this would have paid and help, help you uh, get through the year a little better. And um, the producers that have done that have been quite well or quite happy with how it's worked for them. So. You can learn more about pasture rangeland forage insurance through a webinar from Nebraska Extension's Aaron Berger. That's available on UNL's Beef website or through a link on the Market Journal homepage. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here again for the weekly forecast. Of course, last week we talked about the storm system that moved across the state, kind of played out as anticipated, a very slow moving system. According to the Any Rain Network sites, we basically had one station in the Cortland area that recorded over 6.9 inches with the total storm event precipitation. We had 52 st at least 52 stations that received at least three inches of moisture and another 150 stations that received close to two inches or above in terms of moisture. So fully a third of all of the stations within the any rain network recorded at least two inches of moisture. Very welcome event. Now, last week we talked about a dry pattern holding on till early October. It looks like the model's completely flipped. And here again, we are dealing with another major storm system moving into the United States. So as we go to the upper air models, what we're going to notice is once again we have a large troughing pattern over the western United States, southwesterly flow in the upper atmospheres, 
At the lower atmosphere, we are basically seeing a southerly flow into our region, so this high pressure system kicking moisture in advance of that approaching trough. And so some scattered precipitation late in the day is expected to develop, particularly in the southern plains, but some maybe even in southwest Nebraska. And then tomorrow we see that that low deepens in the upper atmosphere. We see a surface low pressure system starting to line up from the southwest into the southern plains. That's going to lift the moisture into our region and we're looking at scattered showers and thunderstorms, particularly across the eastern half of the state. And then as we go into Monday, that trough starts to move a little bit more toward Nebraska. We still see a series of lows that will be generating around this upper air trough and pushing into the central and southern plains region. And that will keep precipitation in play across eastern Nebraska and potentially into the portions of the panhandle. Then the system appears like it wants to start to open up on Tuesday, but there is another piece of energy that's going to rotate around it, showing low pressure system developing the southern Rockies. And this may actually generate some additional moisture in our region. We're looking at some widespread precipitation across the Panhandle and potentially across eastern Nebraska. And then the system starts to lift toward the north, and we still see some energy rotating around that trough. So low pressure systems at the southern plains on Wednesday will once again generate the potential for scattered shower activity with the heaviest of that over uh, northern Iowa and eastern Nebraska. And then as we get into Thursday, the trough starts to break down. Most of the energy starts to move toward the Great Lakes. High pressure starts to build in from the western United States. And that should effectively cut off a tremendous volume of the precipitation. We do show heavy precipitation over Iowa. I think this will be a little bit farther eastward. And then we see another trough starting in next week and starting to make its way into the Pacific Northwest. This one has a lot of cold air behind it. We're likely to see some freezing temperature across the northern plains as we go into next weekend, potentially some of that making its way into the early part of next week into our region. But most of the precipitation remains east of the state. Now, as we go to the 8 to 14 day forecast, with that trough persistent in the west, we see above normal temperatures to the east. And in terms of precipitation, with that trough coming out and a series of waves moving into our region, above normal moisture next Thursday through the following Tuesday for the northern and central plains. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle prices, farm real estate values, succession planning, and pasture rangeland forage insurance. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next week, John Moret will look at corn and soybean markets, Lee Schultz will analyze the USDA's latest hog inventory estimates, and Dave Aiken will talk about a possible Syngenta settlement. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.